So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laurie, for this invitation. This is um, a, a survey paper that I'm writing together with Luis Garicano of the London School of Economics on Spain and the crisis on Spain that is going to be appearing in a book dedicated to the uh, crisis in the Eurozone. And of course, there are a lot of issues related to the Spanish crisis. You know, so the, what I thought is just to give you a sort of a flavor, an overview of the many interesting things that are taking place in Spain. There are a lot of lessons for everyone, for investors, regulators, supervisors, and so on and so forth, and anyone interested in the macroeconomy at large. So the idea is to give you, a, you know, Spain is very much in the news, to give you a little bit of background that hopefully will help you understand what is going on in Spain. Let me give you, so the way I designed the presentation, this 15, 20 minutes, if I, you allow me, Laurie, uh, is, uh, you know, to give you like in five slides the bottom line, and then I will give you a bunch of plots, and I will try to weave them together in a coherent narrative so we can put it together, and I will end up with a description of what is going on in the Spanish financial system. So the bottom line is, is Spain and the euro in trouble? And the answer is yes. And uh, the problem in Spain is one, as we will see, of private leverage combined with no growth. And that's one of the issues that uh, Spain is confronting as we try to uh, get a hand on this crisis. Uh, as I will show you, Spain's private sector is over leveraged. There's a lot of debt on the Spanish private sector. The state should let private agents fail, even though this doesn't l seem to be forthcoming. We don't have a public debt problem, and that actually is quite an interesting thing in Spain. Spain is not uh, Greece. This is something that people typically get confused with. Spain has run a very fiscally conservative policy for the last hundred years, actually. Spain has been a very uh, fiscally conservatively run country. We should definitely not enter into the stabilization mechanism. That would be very bad for Spain. But the problem is that they go beyond these things. Spain has a problem of growth and how to actually be in the same currency union as Germany. Because as I will try to show you, the fundamental problem of the Eurozone is this diverging productivity uh, trends inside this monetary union. And that's the problem that needs to be addressed in Spain. Now, so what happened in Spain? Uh, in Spain, there was a big real estate boom that essentially masked some deep and resolved structural problems in the Spanish economy. Uh, we have uh, a lot of problems related to uh, rigidities in labor markets, real estate markets, administrative markets. Spain is a country that even though it has a very sophisticated administration, is excessively atomized across the different regions, and certainly our education markets do not work. Okay? And one of the things is that, uh, as you may have heard, Spain actually did very well over the last uh, 10, 15 years. You know, there was something called the Spanish miracle. A lot of things happened in Spain, as tell you about it, but essentially the crisis revealed Spain as a naked swimmer using this beautiful expression from uh, Warren Buffett, you know, that when the tide goes off is when you see who was swimming naked, okay? And uh, Spain was swimming uh, naked, the tide went off, and that's always embarrassing, okay? Now, boom and crisis have a common origin in Spain. I'm going to argue here, it's the euro, okay? And this translated into an excessively accommodating monetary policy for Spain that resulted in a very strong expansion of credit. We'll see something along these lines in a very strong asset bubble, particularly in real estate markets, and a profound misallocation of capital towards construction in the Spanish economy. And actually, this is something that even though there's a lot of debate among labor uh, scholars in Spain, that probably led to a severe misallocation of human capital in, in Spain. And one of the things that it was surprising is that Spain is an overdiagnosed country. A lot of people have known what, uh, what is wrong with Spain for the last quarter century, but very little has been done to address these deep structural problems. Okay? So our hypothesis is that what happened in Spain is that we had a combination of lax monetary policy via the ECB. Okay? Spain needed tougher monetary policy than the one the ECB was willing to implement, combined with nominal realities, translated into strong nominal growth, but also bubbles and troubles, as I say. Okay? Now, many good things happened in Spain. Okay, there was a, sol a lot of fiscal consolidation in order to meet the uh, euro entry criteria. So again, Spain didn't fudge the requirements like Italy or Greece. We did, a, you know, we did our homework. There was a lot of convergence and growth in Spain and you know, we've basically joined the core of the Eurozone. We closed the infrastructure gap. We probably have the best infrastructures right now in Western Europe in terms of highways and high-speed trains. There was a lot of things taking place in, the co in, the, in corporate Spain. You know, for the first time we have great companies that are completely global, like Inditex, the owners of Zara or Santander. And of course, the most important thing that happened in Spain, okay, very good. Okay, so the Euro, Spain, and Germany. The Euro, you have to remember, solved the secular problem of the Spanish economy, which is lack of capital, okay? Spain was a country always tough for capital with, ex you know, there's too much labor relative to capital. But we had a problem in attracting capital. It had to do with our currency and the policy that the Spanish policymakers followed every time Spain got into trouble, which was simply devaluation. Okay? So we get into the euro. 
for the first time, we get this phenomenal inflow of capital, but we get them at the same time that we have these diverging productivity trends. Okay? This is not a problem in the United States because we have a lot of uh, factor mobility, in particular labor factor mobility, and there are a lot of stabilizers inside the, uni the, uh, the United States where their stabilizers are not, do not exist inside the Eurozone. So these diverging productivity trends are completely real. They're, there's nothing nominal about them, you know, and, uh, and you, have to, uh, you have to have different policy tools. Okay? That basically means that right now the only policy available for Spain to improve our competitiveness is via wage deflation. In order to catch up with the Germans, you know, we'll have to make less uh, going forward. And we'll see that we have a long way to go. So let me, we're done with the words, and now let me show you a bunch of plots. You know, the first thing is that, as I was telling you before, and here I put, uh, you know, uh, basically GDP per capita and PPP uh, normalized in the U27 by 100. As you can see, Spain is actually doing very well over this period in terms of convergence. In fact, we're now above the average of the U27, and we're converging to the core of the, uh, of the, uh, of the euro area, okay? Portugal, you know, this is the striking thing about Portugal. There's nothing different between Portuguese and Spaniards. We're essentially the same people, but for whatever reason, nothing has happened in Portugal for the last 15 years. These guys have been in the Great Depression for now 15 years. The Greeks made some progress, but not as much as the Spaniards, okay? Now, the most important consequence of our entry into the euro was what happened to rates. This is something that was worldwide. What you see here is basically Euribor reconstructed going all the way to 1990, which is the interbank lending uh, rate in Europe, which is the blue line, and this is the one-year uh, Spanish Treasury rate. So it's long gone, but when I left Spain, Spain could not fund itself at the same rate as the banks in, the, in, in you know, this uh, candidate Eurozone that didn't exist at that time. Okay? Spain was always uh, needed to pay a big premium over the interbank market in order to fund itself. What happens is not only the generalized drop in rates, but the second point here is the uh, crunching of spreads. There's no longer a premium associated with the possibility of a Spanish default, you know, there's a big, uh, there's a big uh, squeeze of the, um, of the, uh, of the uh, credit spread. Well, once you have low interest rates, well, some assets will, uh, will uh, immediately revalue. And what happened in Spain, for reasons that we're going to see, is we got a big real estate bubble. So this is the price indices, both the general and for Madrid and Barcelona. I'm not going to get, we don't have time to get into the construction of these indices, but they are quite reliable. And what you can see was the phenomenal increase in prices. So, for instance, look at Madrid, you know, which basically tripled in nominal terms from 1995 all the way to the peak of the bubble, which is essentially a decade later. Okay, it really doesn't matter whether you do this in nominal or in real, you're going to get exactly the same plot. But again, you know, you get a phenomenal increase in the real price of uh, housing in the major metropolitan areas of Spain, which are Madrid and Barcelona, and you have a similar one. In, uh, in the overall index, okay? Now, why is this important? Well, it, it, this is very important because Spain is actually an outlier relative to other countries in the, uh, not only in the Eurozone, but in the world. In Spain, ownership <coughs> rates are incredibly high. They're the most, you know, the highest among the advanced nations. So there was a phenomenal wealth effect associated with the revaluation of the real estate, uh, the, the, the real estate uh, uh, assets, okay? And this was widely felt uh, uh, in the Spanish society. The fact that prices went up by a lot and that everybody owns a house in Spain or a big chunk of the population owns a house, well, that basically meant, uh, you know, that people felt very, very wealthy and this had a strong um, consequences for consumption and the internal demand patterns in Spain. In addition, Spain is an outlier in this, all our mortgages are arms, adjustable rate mortgages. So in Spain, monetary policy transmission is mechanical. It's, you know, it goes directly to households. Every time the ECB changes the rates, it gets translated immediately into the rate that the Spanish households are paying on their mortgages. Okay? So you know, we call this monetary policy um, in the vein, is how we call it in Spain. You know, Spain is a country that is very sensitive to monetary policy shocks. Okay? And of course, the real estate bubble and the ownership rates have very important social effects in what it refers to household formation and demographic e effects that we don't have the time to discuss here. So these are non-trivial problems for the Spanish economy that translate into many other different things. Okay? So why did we have a, a real estate bubble other countries didn't have? So we're still struggling with this. A bunch of Spanish economists are working on this, on this problem, but it has to do a little bit with the structure of a labor market. Spain is a country characterized by a large percentage of temporary contracts. These are people you can hire for a few months and then fire away. Construction is a company that uh, is, a, is an industry that works very much based on temporary contracts. It turns out that our laws are very conducive to this type of contracts in the labor market. And the percentage of temporary contracts in Spain is much higher than any other country in the European Union. And in fact, Spain accounts for the majority of the temporary contracts in the European Union. Okay? So here you have the comparison between a, 
uh, Spain and France, for instance, and everybody thinks that France and Spain have very similar labor market uh, institutions. They do. The devil is always in the details when it comes to the labor market, and it small differences can translate into big differences in patterns on temporary contracts. So you had a pool of workers who could immediately join in a labor-intensive industry, which was construction, to start, uh, to start uh, you know, this construction boom that we saw in Spain. How big was it? Well, if you actually use uh, something like a measure like house prices to income, how many years would it take to fully pay your house should you enter into a mortgage in Spain? In Spain, that number got as high as almost eight years, whereas in the UK, it stuck at six years, and the United States was four years. So in terms of magnitude, the real estate uh, bubble in Spain is a biggie. Okay, this was a big, big real estate bubble relative to the one we saw in the UK and in the United States. Okay? Very well. One question that you always have to ask yourself is, well, how was it funded? You know, Spain is a country that, you know, saw a phenomenal investment, phenomenal consumption, and we borrowed massively from abroad in order to fund this phenomenal expansion of our, of our both our fixed capital and our household capital. Okay? Well, it basically, you run big current account deficits. So here you have the current account deficit as a percentage of GDP for Spain and Germany. Spain, uh, Germany is one of our largest trade partners. And it kind of, many of you may have seen this plot for the US and China. And what you can see is that the surplus of one country is kind of the deficit of the other one. That's the beautiful thing about this plot. They're kind of the mirror image one of the other. But I want to uh, point out something, uh, something a little bit more interesting than just that. So these brown lines represent devaluations when we had our own currency. The purple line represents entry into the euro, okay? And the green line represents projections by the IMF, uh, the point at from which you know, projections from the IMF start. As you can see, every time Spain had a problem with its current account deficit, what happened is that the Spanish policymakers would come and devalue the currency. And that basically put a kind of a cap on how bad the current account deficit could get. The problem, of course, is that once we enter into the euro, this is no longer possible. We no longer have control of our monetary policy, and the market you know, will keep lending you money in order to fund whatever it is that you're funding, whether it be uh, houses or you know, fixed capital uh, formation. But the deficit in Spain, the current account deficit in Spain, got as high as 10%. Spain actually was, uh, in terms of GDP, the second largest borrower in the world after the United States for many years in a row. Spain is a relatively large economy, by the way. This is another thing that people typically forget. It's the ninth largest economy in the world with a trillion euros of GDP. So this represented a big imbalance around the world. Okay? So we're getting indebted with respect to uh, the, rest of the, the rest of the world. And the reason is because the Spaniards are becoming progressively less productive. Here you have unilevel cost for three countries. Spain, the red, France, the blue, and Germany, the black line. And I've normalized the data, which is from Eurostat, uh, starting in 1997, which is typically the, day, the year that is taken to be the beginning of the real estate bubble in Spain. And what you can see is that in terms of unit labor cost, Spain has been losing ground steadily against the Germans for the last uh, 10, 15 years. So that basically means that we're becoming less competitive. Okay? So, no, so it's not a surprising uh, fact that you know, we keep borrowing from, uh, from the rest of the world in order to... Uh, in order to fund our, um, it's just we're simply not very competitive overall, even though Spain, by the way, has a very dynamic export sector. The fact that you're not competitive overall, that doesn't mean that you, ha you don't have a sports sector that is very vi you know, vi you know, vibrant and dynamic, and we do have that, okay? And actually, during this crisis, the Spanish sports sector has held quite well. It's not just Spain, but many other countries face the same problems. Very well. So how do, we come, how do we come indebted, essentially? You know, well, you know, we were borrowing a lot. You know, where is the debt coming? So as I was telling you before, the debt in Spain is private. It's not public. So here you have a bunch of advanced nations ordered by the level of debt. The country that is most indebted when you add up all the debt is Japan, then the UK, then in Spain. But uh, Spain is mostly private debt rather than public debt. In Spain, everything is a problem of the uh, private sector. And in Spain, the outlier is precisely the households. Our households are very different than German, Italian, or French households. They have a lot of debt. Okay, they have a lot of debt. And it's not surprising every time you have a real estate bubble and you have a country with high ownership rates, the only way you can access housing in Spain is via ownership. It, it has to come at the expense of having the households borrowing a lot in order to fund the purchase of the house. As a result, we have a very negative net international investment position with respect to the world. So this is basically you know, we take the assets, subtract the liabilities with respect to the rest of the world. Spain essentially has around 1 trillion euros worth of paper floating around the world. This is probably an underestimation, by the way, of net. So the gross is even larger. Okay, the gross is even larger. So in net, there's 1 trillion euros walking around the world of a Spanish paper, of a Spanish liability between public and private. Okay? 
who owns that? Well, if you're running, if Germans are running a large current account surplus with Spain, they're going to end up with a lot of Spanish paper. So no wonder German banks have a lot of Spanish uh, paper in the asset side of the balance sheet, mostly the banks, but also the French, with whom we run also a current account deficit. Okay? So there's a lot of sp Spanish paper in the uh, balance sheet of the big German and French institutions, whether it be insurance companies or banks. No wonder Spain is of a big... Uh, it's a big topic of discussion in the Eurozone. It's, it's large in terms of quantities, and there's a lot of Spanish paper. Forget about Portugal. That's a drop in the ocean compared to Spain. Okay, if we go down, we're going to have a wonderful time. <laughs> so at least it will be entertaining. So there you have a plot of the household leverage uh, over, the last, uh, over the last few years. And what you can see is basically <laughs> as normalized by Spain's, uh, by Spain's GDP. And what you saw is that you know, it was around 40%, and it goes all the way up to 90%. Okay? So the debt is sitting in the Spanish households. Spain was a fiscally conservative country, as I was telling you before. Our debt to GDP actually went down all the way down to 38%. For many years, Spain was among the countries in the OECD, the one with the lowest debt to GDP ratio. Again, Spain is fiscally very conservatively run. And uh, you know, as for the Spanish financial institutions, what you saw is that they were the ones essentially funding the boom. And the way they were doing is expanding the amount of credit they were willing to issue relative to the deposits. So here what I did was basically look at the uh, uh, data for credit institutions that includes banks and savings and loans in Spain, took all the credit they issued divided by the amount of deposits, and essentially what you can see is in the early part of the sample, you know, essentially credit is around 75 to 80 percent. So, you know, you have uh, for every hundred dollars of deposits, you are basically given around 75 uh, dollars of credit, and at some point it goes all the way up to uh, 150. So that basically means that you are borrowing in the wholesale market in order to give that additional loan. You're funding your expansion of your balance sheet not via deposit generation, but basically borrowing. No wonder Spain at some point there's kind of a run in the wholesale market for Spanish debt. That basically means the Spanish credit system needs to refinance itself on a regular basi basis on the wholesale market. And, uh, you know, because we have a lot of uh, liabilities in. Um, so just to uh, conclude, just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the problem in Spain, what I did here was take basically the overall credit uh, issued in Spain. The red line is the actual credit issued in Spain. Everything here is in uh, billions of euros. And uh, this is in billions? Yes, in billions of euros, OK? And uh, so this is 250. Just to give you an idea, remember the Spanish economy is around a trillion euros. The this is the red line, OK? The actual realized sequence of credit issued in Spain. The blue line is how credit should have grown if it had grown at the same rate as GDP. If you believe credit and GDP are co-integrated somehow, they should be growing more or less at the same rate. You know, you can go through a period where, you know, perhaps it's growing a little bit faster, but, you know, it should come back together. You can think of this gap as precisely the gap that arises on account of the uh, credit bubble in Spain. Okay, there's a phenomenal amount of credit. Right now there's around 1.7 trillion euros of outstanding credit. And I want to leave you with this message, you know. Even though the credit expansion, as you can imagine, has stopped, there's no more credit being issued in Spain, that the leveraging hasn't started yet. These balance sheets have to go down. <coughs> we have to start repaying. So that basically means there's going to be very little in terms of credit generation in Spain. So with the consequences for growth that we're going to see. Thank you.